Chalk History Festival special series on history with Jackson. Hello and welcome to History of Jackson, the home of accessible and digestible history. And welcome to our Chalk History Festival special series. We'll be talking to some of the historians, living historians and performers here at Chalk about what they're doing at the festival and their work. Now, Chalk History Festival will be covered comprehensively through History of Jackson, be it on our social media, our blog, and our podcast. So if you wanted to check out more and learn more about what's happening at Chalk, do head to the links in the description below. Now, without further ado, I'll leave you to our Chalk History Festival special series episode. So hello and welcome to our Chalk History Festival special series here on History of Jackson. And now we are joined by Professor Chris Lintot. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Just got here, but what a marvellous spot to be in. And I've already seen, I think, a Viking and a couple of Napoleonic <laughs> fighters wandering around. So I'm having fun already. Yeah, it's a great, and it's, the weather is absolutely brilliant as well. So yeah, I wanted to, to ask you, your your talk is from uh, Aliens to Astronomy. Oh, sorry. That's right, aliens yeah. to asteroids. Yeah. Aliens, yeah. aliens to asteroids. Sorry, I'm, I'm that, a historian. It's fine, it's fine. Aliens Anything to asteroids, with yeah, the history yeah. of unlikely astronomy. How, what inspires you to get into that topic? Well, it's the unlikely bit. It's the accidental universe is what we're talking about because I think people have this idea that, you're, that we're clever, right? <laughs> that when you meet an astronomer, one of the things people say to me is, oh, you must be really smart because we've got <laughs> you know, hundreds of years of good branding, but also the sense that there's some deep understanding of the universe. But a lot of the time we stumble on truth that, like in history, you find yeah. a thing that suddenly changes the story you're telling, that we're lucky that something flies through the solar system or a supernova goes off bang at the right time. And it's those contingent events that tell us the history of how we got to be here and, and the story of how the universe will evolve. So I think it's trying to deconstruct this idea that it's about clever men writing things in chalk. It's <laughs> most of the time it's about keeping an eye on the universe and, and hoping to be inspired by it. That's, that's, that's a lovely answer, keeping an eye on it and wanting to be inspired by it. And those, those big events, how much of an impact do they have on you? Because you're, you're not only observing them as a scientist, an astronomer and a physicist, but you're also observing them as a human, as a person who is being affected by them. So how do they impact you? Yeah, there are a few, I think, stories in my own life that, that really stuck at the back of my brain. One of them was in 1994, I was still at school, when a comet called Schumacher Levy 9 was discovered. And this was not just one comet, but a whole string of cometlets, little bits of comet. And the reason it was strung out like this was that it got too close to Jupiter. And over the course of a summer's week, a bit like this, they crashed into Jupiter. And we could see, even with my tiny telescope that I had, that I raised money for by selling ice cream on Torquay <laughs> Seafront, um, this tiny telescope would show me the bruises that had happened as this comet hit Jupiter. And nothing like this had ever been consciously seen before. And so that really hardwired my brain to want to be excited by the universe, to be excited by these discoveries. And now when we do get the unexpected, I think that's the thing. Those are the fun bits. The, when we're w wandering around the office going, I don't know what this is, or trying to argue to point <laughs> telescopes at a weird thing. That's the fun bit. It's not the Hollywood bit of, my God, I have an idea. <laughs> we have been proved right. Aren't I a great scientist? It's the, what on earth is that? I don't know. Let's, let's go find out. That's the exciting part of doing science. That's, that's so awesome because it, it, it lines up with a lot of historians said about there's, there's personal stories behind wanting to be interested and, and develop those interests and, and that's learn right. more. Yeah, and I guess people pick their period of history often because of their own encounters and, and inspirations. So there's that connection as well. You know, people study the distant universe or planets because of their connections and, and what they're interested in. But I also talk about, I often think of it, what we do as sort of really slow archaeology. <laughs> so I have friends who actually do space archaeology, like the archaeology of the space age. But what I mean by that is sort of we can't do experiments, unlike other physicists who have labs and, and lasers and things like that. We're just stuck with what we can see about the universe. You know, we're stuck with what we happen to be able to observe in the same way that if you're a historian of Roman Britain, you don't get to time travel. You're stuck with the villa that survived or the pot that you found or the coins that were dug up. And you might hope for new discoveries, but you can't influence them in some way. And so I think astronomy and history share that as well, this sort of reliance on what we stumble across. 
And I love the, the crossover. I think it's absolutely remarkable that we have more in common as scientists and historians than we uh, people mm. think that we do. But when you talk about the unseen, I can't, I can't get away from the word aliens. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, why have we got this obsession with aliens? Well, I think we're kind of lonely, not just astronomers. I mean, as a, <laughs> as a species, you know, we, we, we want somebody to talk to. And I think um, there's also this, I think there's this thought that nags away at people. So you look up at the night sky on a beautiful, clear night, and you see a universe that seems to stretch forever. And we can say the word billions a lot if it helps. And you've got two options. One is we're, as far as the cosmos has got, in producing intelligent life. And that doesn't feel right. That, you know, if we're it, then, you know, it seems a bit of a waste <laughs> to have billions of galaxies. On the other hand, you look up and there's a cosmos teeming with life. And then that's a strange thought as well, because are we going to meet these other intelligences, what they'd be like? So I think the brain gets stuck on both of those possibilities. And I think that's where the fascination comes from. But it's become a real scientific question. We're finding um, new homes for life. So we now know planets are really common in the cosmos. So when you do look up at that night sky, most of the stars that you see have planets and lots of them have places that might be homes for our kind of life. And so if there are places there, then we need to be creative about how we look for alien life. And one of the things I'll be talking about tonight is, is how to do that better than we've managed until now. <laughs> and then in terms of choosing where to look then, you know, you've got such amazing technology nowadays, but no, like you said, there's billions of places there you are. can point yeah. it. How, how do you make that decision and spend those millions of pounds in pointing that technology there? Yeah, well, partly we just argue with each other. <laughs> so, so for the, the most expensive telescopes, things like JWST, which is our newly launched space telescope, which is this gorgeous toy, we just argue. And so people pitch and you say, I need 90 minutes to do this. My friends say they want an hour to do that. Um, but the other thing we're doing is... We're getting into surveys, so I'm working on a telescope with many other people called the Vera Rubin Observatory. It's going to be in Chile, and it's going to scan the whole sky every three nights, and then that data is then available for everyone. So if you study galaxies, you can go and look at it, asteroids or anything else, it'll all be in there. The only problem is um, it's 30 terabytes of data a night. Uh, to put that in perspective, um, we built a system so that if it spots that anything's moved or changed, it'll tell us. It sends out a little text message. But if you subscribe, you're going to wake up to 10 million text messages. <laughs> and so the challenge is, how do we find in that 10 million, how do I find the one thing that's worth looking at? And that, that's a difficult problem. And that, that is absolutely awesome. But that 30 terabytes is unbelievable. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm not jealous of you for having to go through that yeah, and get those text messages. Some of them should be beautiful images, <laughs> though. So that will be cool. Now, based on one question, you know, we've, even though it's not the night right now, we have a very beautiful sky. Yeah, and this is a dark sky area as well, of course. So this is one of the best places in the country to come to see oh, the night sky. Awesome. But what are you most looking forward to seeing tonight, here at Chalk or here in the sky? Well, we've got a, a few planets in the morning sky at the minute. So I'm told there's a chance of sitting out and having deep conversations around the bar later on. So if we do that, Saturn rises about midnight and it's the first Jupiter and Mars come up much later on. So maybe we'll still be up for Jupiter and Mars, but Saturn's <laughs> always fun uh, to see that in the sky. And if we, people have got binoculars with them, you can just about still see the rings at the minute. Oh, awesome. um, so yeah, Saturn this evening. But it's also a t pretty terrible time of year for those of us who like the night sky. Good news is summer's nearly over. The nights are drawing in and we'll have proper astronomy back soon. Oh, awesome. Oh, that, I can't wait to see Saturday. You've got me really Good. excited for it Excellent. now. Thank you. Now, you've been at Chalk only for a few hours, mm. if, if that. What are you most looking forward to exploring this, this afternoon well, before I you talk? I think this is a place of enthusiasms from what I can see. I think everyone's <laughs> here because they're enthusiastic about one or many things and those are the best people to spend time with. So I'm looking forward to, to chatting to people, find out why they're here and, and what their equivalent of my comet hitting Jupiter yeah. is. Uh, I think everyone must have one of those stories here. Oh, awesome. And then for people who are listening and watching, and they want to go and interact with you and your work online, yeah. where can they go? There's two things. Um, I'm still on Twitter uh, as Chris Lintot, but I also uh, lecture for Gresham College, which is a 16th century institution that still exists, still gives talks on the same seven subjects, including <laughs> astronomy. So you can find that on YouTube. Or uh, I help run a project called the Zooniverse, where people sort through images and do science for us. If you go there, zooniverse.org, but you can even discover a planet, which might be quite wow. cool. That's awesome. Well, thank you very much for coming on. Chris. Pleasure. Nice to it. meet you. Take care.